Hello, everyone. My name is Blake Hansen, and I am a partner in the TCS M&A Group and based in California. My discussion today is on finding and capturing energy savings. Uh, let's start with the definition. Mergers and acquisitions are based on a financial proposition. The success measured in numbers like dollars and cents and cash flow, net worth, stock price, um, market share, tax savings, and so on. In most cases, the financial proposition is based on capturing synergies, both cost and revenue. And in most cases, the initial estimates for these synergies are based on limited information. The discussion today it will focus on where to find synergies, how to value them, and very importantly, how to capture them. Mergers in banking, investment houses, and insurance companies are as old as those institutions themselves. We are witnessing the convergence of all kinds of technologies and market forces in this sector. For, in, uh, for example, cards and credit card payments and electronic payments have long overtaken cash for most customer segments. 64% of all cell phone owners make digital payments uh, last year, and 39% of those use digital payments on a regular basis. Cryptocurrencies and blockchain and are all beginning to disrupt the, uh, uh, the payment process Machine learning and decisioning continues to replace labor in many of the aspects of the business. And things like insurance and e-brokerage and app in the, in the new and young customer market. And they're offering low-cost, convenient financial transactions integrated with seamless online platforms connected to their social media, the way people like to see that. We're all seeing it. The consumer smartphone is now the new financial institution. And having a compelling presence there is really mission critical. And for most, acquisitions and mergers will be an important component for enabling their future in this, eco this new ecosystem. And as hard as it is to make them find the right M&A deal, most of the challenges come in making the deal work with valuing and capturing the synergies that every M&A deal promises. So let's start with the simple definition of M&A and its common motivators. A merger or acquisition is the act of consolidating companies or assets with an eye towards stimulating growth, gaining competitive advantage, increasing market share, or influencing supply chains. The four most common motivators for acquiring or merging are increasing market share or strengthening market position, increasing the buying power, achieving the forecast per unit from economies of scale, or access to differentiating technology on either the operations or information sides. These motivators, <clears throat> excuse me, these motivators are the main places we look for synergistic value. So let's discuss synergies next. For this discussion, the synergy is the source of any action that increases the shareholder value of a merged enterprise above the combined value of the two individual companies. Shareholder value comes from two sources, increasing revenue beyond the mere addition of the two companies or reducing the per unit operating expense achieved by simplifying the combined assets and processes resulting in economies of scale. While every synergy effective uh, effect on value, it has to influence one or more of the four outputs of the valuation process. And that includes higher cash flows from existing assets like cost savings or, and economies of scale, higher expected growth rates like market power or higher growth potential, a longer growth period from increased competitive advantages, or even a lower cost of capital like higher debt capacity. If you search the internet, you'll find lots of opinions on how to classify synergies, but in reality, there are really only two types. There are the synergies that revenue generating, uh, generating synergies create. That's the increased revenues from products and customer sales and services. 
This also has the ability to command higher prices by having a more dominant position in the customer's financial wallet. In this case, we're looking to achieve more with the same. For a cost savings synergy, this is essentially the opposite of a revenue synergy. The combined assets and the capabilities of the two companies create an economic scale, economies of scale, that reduce the cost and provide greater profits which that can be achieved uh, had the two companies been uh, operating separately. This can include specific financial synergies from decreased cost of capital through lower risk, better cash flows, and increased financial margins. In this case, we're looking to achieve the same with less. So with that in mind, let's explore two major types of synergies just a bit more. There are four typical places where we find synergy opportunities to achieve enhanced revenue generation. They include uh, things like uh, complementary products that can be bundled or cross or cross sold or upsold that produce higher sales and their customer wallet share. There are synergies that provide rapid access to complementary locations and potential customers and distribution channels expand market presence or create new ones. There are synergies that enhance our brand or enable us to leverage the expanded market share to command higher prices. And there are synergies that come from access to intellectual property, from product technologies, patents, and even talent pools that can create more competitive products and new markets. A good example of this is branding technology, where there are like branded systems for loan origination or investment insights or claim processing that can be used to generate greater revenue in the new combined organization. What's interesting here is that the, the potential for revenue generating synergies is kind of based on the law of large numbers, which really means even a two or three percent increase in revenue from synergies can more than offset a potentially large shortfall with cost synergies. On a percentage basis alone, SG&A provides the greatest opportunities to mine for cost synergies. There are eight places where cost savings synergies are typically found. Uh, the first is real estate, which is in the form of retail branches or call centers or office space, and those are typically the prime targets for those. There are the ability to consolidate uh, the consolidation of sales and marketing channels, often providing that kind of cost savings. Consolidating centralized F&A functions like finance and HR and legal and purchasing and even IT are generally straightforward. Consolidating distri distributed functions like sales and field service also provide synergies for cost savings. And although supply chain is generally a bigger opportunity in other industries like manufacturing and energy, banking and financial institutions still buy a lot of goods and materials to support branch operations and sales office space. Again, those are opportunities that should be considered. From my salaries perspective, the merged enterprises, the new merged companies don't need two CEOs, they don't need two CFOs. And again, this logic kind of continues all the way down the entire organization chart, looking for ways where, again, there's opportunities to save on the salary and wages side. Um, there are financial savings to be had from supplier volume discounts like in licensing fees and lower cost of capital, tax benefits, and even increased debt capacity. If the acquirer used to pay the target firm for a fee for access to proprietary technology, a merge can actually make that transfer right of, of that patent in much, be much less expensive and even eliminating that expense. Consolidation of the same or similar IT or information technology is also generally a prime source for cost synergies. This really comes in two parts, where the great, where, where there is great value in the sameness and consistency in the eyes of the customer, there's opportunities for rationalizing technology. And where there's branded technology that can be used with minimal incremental cost can be used in a much broader way, again, achieving greater efficiency or economy of scale from using that technology. And although R&D typically is quite small compared to other industries like life sciences, 
opportunities still exist where both firms have teams of people that are building new, new products and services. And while it's convenient to separate Revit synergies and cost synergies for a discussion like this, what should not be forgotten is the correlation between the two and how they can depend upon each other. In retail banking, for example, important cost-based cost -based synergies are expected to come from consolidating branch networks. And the acquired bank assumes, generally, that while some customers might leave, the cost savings will more than uh, make up for the, the losses that will be incurred. The question you're probably asking yourself about now is, how possible are these types of revenue and cost synergies to make my specific m and real? Synergy opportunities really start with the intent and how the two entities will work together for future success, which ultimately can be described by the need for autonomy and the need for integration. Where both companies have a highly diverse business environment and the value for integration is low, synergy opportunities really only exist in the reporting and internal communication areas. If the business environments are different, because of perceived branding differences or occupy different spaces in the value chain, there are potential value, uh, synergy opportunities in back office and operational processes. An example of this would be with a NAP bank or an e-insurer that is owned by a traditional brick and mortar bank or insurance company. Where there is high overlap of similar products and services and where the parent is acquiring essentially scale Every aspect of the business is a potential synergy opportunity. And then acquisitions by a private equity firm or a holding company really offer the fewest synergy opportunities. There really are no areas for business, uh, uh, business commonality. And of course, the simple diagram implies simple alternative, alternatives, and this is rarely the case. Many M&A deals do not neatly fit into any one of these four categories and often span several. In the cases where, where the need for integration is medium to high, we can, we, we can refine our search further for synergies by comparing the market access and operational capabilities of the two companies. Market access is, are things like Salesforce and branding, et cetera. And operational capabilities are the business operations and cost structure, supply chain, and such what we've been talking about previously. Cost efficiency synergies through economies of scale are the greatest where both companies have highly similar market access and operational capabilities. Where one company has better market access and operational model, there are enhancement synergies that offer potential increases in efficiency and effectiveness. And often the, com the combined power of both entities creates synergistic opportunities for both business expansion and the potential to explore new business models and markets. It's important to note that synergies in one area doesn't preclude synergies in another. This means that synergies may abound across the whole continuum of efficiency through exploration. In our quest for synergy savings, it's important to note that time and culture can have a dramatic impact on realizing savings. Synergies are not effective immediately after the merger trans transaction takes place. And it usually takes one to three years before synergy, the synergy annuity begins. Cost synergies can be realized faster than revenue, revenue synergies, but generally have a lower impact on potential financial performance. In the interim, costs often, often go up during the incurring of one-time costs and some short-term efficiencies. No history of working together and cultural clashes can impact synergy capture success. And if the culture class is too great, some, synergy, some synergies may never be realized. And in the world of synergies, time is not your friend. And the long, longer it takes to complete the integration, the more likely that synergies will underachieve their expected value. And finally, there are several factors to consider when quantifying the synergies, both on the cost side and the, that's required as well as the value created. Value areas can be, that can be quantified include 
higher cash flows from existing assets, like cost savings and economies of scale, higher expected growth rates like market power and high potential growth, uh, lower growth potential from increased competitive advantages, and lower cost of capital from higher debt capacity. Cost areas include both one-time costs, but don't forget the missed opportunity costs from short-term inefficiencies. Additional factors to, for determining value include the value property, proper probabilities for achieving synergy and the value factoring the time and value factoring the time to benefit. And while it's generally understood that synergy valuing is a point time analysis, the Washington State revisit and adjust the cost and benefit estimates during the synergy integration program. Back in the 1950s, uh, during the heady days of public auctions for offshore drilling, drilling rights in the Gulf of Mexico, there really was no accurate way to determine the value of an offshore oil field. In that bidding frenzy, oil companies would frequently overvalue and overpay due to emotional reasons. The termed, or the, they, there was a term created based on that called the winner circle, based on the negative impact from overvaluing, which is attributed to the winner better winning better and not to the acquiring asset the term winner's curse is now found in its way through all parts of the organization and the enterprises including public auctions and ipos and even m a synergies are always a factor of the acquired acquired company and not the acquiring company m a deals can be susceptible to the winner's curse from both a revenue and cost synergies perspective where limited information is available about the internal operations of the acquired asset. However, there are a few ways to beat the odds, and the biggest odds beater is great execution. Having great and having talent, great mental processes, and well-worn playbooks for planning and execution make all the difference in the world. A B-quality strategy combined with an A-quality execution outperform, outperforms the best strategy that has mediocre execution. I hope you've enjoyed today's discussion and hopefully it's been helpful for you in evaluating your next M&A deal and how to achieve and achieve and value your synergy savings. Here are a few parting thoughts. Identifying and estimating and capturing synergies, synergies should be a continuous learning process. It is worth the effort to capture learnings real time and continually enhance your evaluation processes and frameworks. If you don't have an M&A playbook, build one. Most cost synergies have a sell-by date that is usually within 18 months. If they aren't achieved by then, most likely they never will. While there's great value in having a ready-to-go playbook, no two deals are the same, and quantitative analysis can't measure some of the intrinsic values that impact value. And finally, the integration plan is crucial. Ex execution done well can exceed the expected energy, the synergy targets every time. I appreciate you uh, participating, or at least joining in this conversation. Please use your chat window to submit any questions. Thank you. Hi, uh, so this is Blake again. Um, I got the first question. Uh, someone asked a question about hostile takeovers and if, if they also are applied to have the same principles. Largely, yes. I think the most difficult issue with hostile takeovers is the fact that, again, there's resistance to providing any information or collecting any information that you need to, to actually make good decisions about synergies. You also know, for instance, that there's going to be a, a substantial amount of potential resistance to any kind of acquisition that's done there. I wanted to go on with that because there's another question that came in pretty similar to that one, uh, which were really around how do you avoid the issue of, of winners and losers and how do you minimize the resistance to change? Again, the first question that everyone asks is what does this change mean to me and my job? 
I know it sounds obvious, but I can't overstress the importance of regular top-down communications about everyone being in the team together, about the purpose, about the objectives, and expected outcomes. It's also expected, as you know, that not everyone will like the changes that are going to be required. And, but everyone will generally do their best if they, can, if they can understand the why and specifically their role to make it happen. Um, the, another question that just popped through is, what is the best time to plan for great execution? Well, in my opinion, that starts even before the acquisition takes place. And then, frankly, there's a lot of things that you can do in advance to kind of both accelerate the, accelerate, uh, the, the merger integration or the acquisition integration and also accelerate the synergy benefits. It really starts with well-documented processes. The cost models, kind of IT architectures, really those are the, kind of a great place to start. Having an M&A playbook, I think we've talked about that one, is also a, a great place that has things like templates for gathering data, for estimating synergies, models that you've done before in the past that will help with that estimating process. Governance models and migration plans help. And again, I think the most successful that I've seen are those which have kind of factory-like models, especially for data extraction and migration and system and rationalization. Um, another question, essential team members of best practice execution planning and delivery teams. It's interesting that I, I'm, I'm, I'm interpreting that to mean what are, again, the, the, uh, the essential team members for kind of best practice. Clearly the core team for for estimating and planning for, for for synergies starts with, again, the process side representing from, from that side, but it could be the IT side as well. I think for a lot of organizations, IT can represent up to 70% of the migration cost. So getting IT involved early and throughout can really help provide insights into what's easy and what's hard from an IT perspective and kind of help with the estimating and lead times for change and ensure that the IT changes enable the, 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 the uh, will enable future flexibility. But really, representation from the business, from virtually every process area of the business, geography clearly is an important element, IT, and a good governance model that enables all that to happen. Um, let's see, another question that just came along uh, is, is ultimately around how do you how do you deal with those who are who really won't support a change or don't won't really adapt to the new business model in terms of enabling synergies to take place and I think that's certainly a, I think that's the age old HR question that comes along uh, how do you deal with those who who don't catch the vision or aren't willing to be a part of the future that this uh, this new acquisition or Merger integration has uh, speaks of in terms of possibilities, and I think ultimately getting one on board, helping them see their their uh, opportunity inside the future model is a big is a big help. Ultimately, we all know everyone has a choice. Um, let's see. Other questions. Oh, here's one more. Um, one about, uh, again, M&A playbooks and how to make those, you know, again, keep them relevant if, in fact, there are uh, infrequent acquisitions or uh, integrations that are done in any period of time. Um, keeping relevant really starts with typically how, what the type of M&A projects you typically acquire, you typically deal with. A lot of organizations that I work with are serial acquirers. They buy lots of small companies. And so they have well-defined processes for, for doing the small, the small acquisitions at a location uh, or a business area. The bigger challenged ones right now are around moving in more into the digital arena and to try to acquire digital capabilities that will enable them to, to move in a different model. Ultimately, there are the frameworks around, around to, in, in our mind, the success models around digital are around in the cloud, AI driven, and and the, the key elements for that is around having good analytic systems and the processes for for making those work. Uh, any other questions? Uh, here one. Here's one more. Uh, 
Uh, historically, people went after cost synergies. Uh, now the goal is more growth and innovation. How does that change the execution planning effort? Again, that's that's a I think the most powerful as we mentioned I mentioned in the presentation earlier that revenue synergies are really ultimately around being able to find ways to bring the capabilities of the of the, of the acquired asset and the organization that's acquiring into a new into a in a collaborative environment to not only capitalize on you know sharing capabilities but also finding new capabilities that are broader than just the the two. The, with the goal of growth, it really is around looking at uh, how did the sum of the parts equal more than just the whole itself. And how that changes the execution planning effort is really the intention that there is a specific defined bucket for where does innovation and how will innovation play in terms of future success. So again, there's, there's the speed to kind of getting the synergies of like processes and capability, but there's also the uh, the idea that the investments that are being made in terms of revenue synergies has a specific defined bucket also for innovation and future growth. Um, a new question. The emergence of new ecosystems and platform business models are, are possibly changing the role of M&A. Put the old build by ally decisioning into question. Maybe now more uh, about allying. Do M and A playbooks still apply in allying? And I think that that's that's a pretty phenomenal question. The idea is that ecosystems, as we talked about, really are the uh, partnerships between organizations. But I think there also looks you look into the ecosystem model and say, where are there gaps in the, the organizations that you can partner with, and that will collaboratively play with you? And where, in fact, can you in fact build and buy? and expand to be able to fill in that opportunity. Because ultimately around an ecosystem, it's around the white space. The idea is that there are gaps in the ecosystem that will enable you or prevent you from being able to capitalize on a new client model, a new business model, a new product model. And so again, there is some changes to the playbook in terms of how do you establish partnerships as opposed to how do I acquire and assimilate. Uh, but I think it's a great point though but ultimately, ecosystems have a huge role in, in terms of what you choose to buy, what you choose to acquire, uh, and, and how and versus what you want to work through on a, a partnership model. A lot of organizations that I have worked with have used partnership models or an ecosystem model to experiment with the idea of a new market. And then once that market looks promising or becomes promising, to then expand their territory within that space as well. I see just one more question coming through, and it's really around how, how do you rationalize key business processes in a kind of a again in a in a way that enables future growth in a, in a speedy way. And again, it really ultimately comes back down to again identifying where there are like processes versus highly diversified, and if those in fact those different processes are meaningful to a to the new operating model. Um, I've been recently working with an organization uh, that actually acquired another company, but 